comment. I'm Jay Spear, with the director of the Virginia Poverty Law Center. I'm going to introduce the uh, moderator and the panelists tonight. Um, they all sent me some things to tell you, so I won't <laughs> give you all their. One thing I've always hated is so once I went to this college and graduated from that school. And, but I've got some, some other things I just pulled out for you. Um, <laughs> our moderator is going to be uh, Anna Edwards. She is the manager of library programs at the Williamsburg Community House. She has hosted a weekly radio program called Defenders Live on WRIR 97.2 since 2005. Um, she has an interest in, and I thought this was very interesting, she has an interest in facilitating the opening up of minds of all, especially her own. Um, and next, uh, Reverend Ben Campbell, um, who probably needs no introduction to most folks. Um, he is the pastoral director of Richmond Hill, an ecumenical Christian community and retreat center on Church Hill. I once had the chance to attend a uh, retreat there, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a wonderful place to have a retreat. Um, he's the co-founder of the MICA Association, which links 104 faith communities to 25 inner city elementary schools in Richmond. I've also participated in the uh, MICA Association, so I have another connection. It's 126 now. <laughs> um, He's just finished a book entitled Richmond's Unhealed History. And he is a native of Virginia, and I think he said he was the sixth generation, and went to segregated public schools. Um, I, I'll tell you, I also attended segregated public schools, but it wasn't officially segregated. Right, ours was. <laughs> um, and we have uh, Professor Dr. John Neeser. Um, he is a professor emeritus of urban studies and planning at VCU, where he taught for over 34 years. Currently, he is senior fellow at the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement at the University of Richmond. His scholarship has focused on post-World War II policies in politics in Richmond, city-suburban relationships, and the racial and geographic dimensions of poverty in Central Virginia. And he's, he has great graphs and maps, if you ever get a chance to <laughs> hear him in another uh, forum. Um, what he told me in his email was, I've been called lots of names over the years, <laughs> many of which are not names of endearment, but the nicer name, the one I like the most, is that a little boy and a little girl gave me granddad. <laughs> I would like to point out to all the panelists, I gave you the chance to give me witty things like that. <laughs> um, and then we have Dr. Sean Yucci. Um, he was born and reared in St. Albans section of Queens, New York. He is a psychologist by training and has recently tried his hand at documentary film. Yes, he he is currently chair of African American Studies and a professor of psychology at VCU. He enjoys traveling and recently returned from Ghana, West Africa, where he was a visiting professor in the Department of Psychology. Thank you. Is that means Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, is, is, uh, Katie here too? I don't see Katie McCaffrey. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to thank Katie for contacting me for, and Rachel, and um, and of course thank Home and um, and the Virginia Poverty Law Center for. Uh, for having this event, and um, and it was interesting when Katie uh, wrote me initially about it. Um, first, thing, first thing I thought because you know the panel was already decided, and so I thought, well, look at that, it's all men. Isn't that <laughs> <interesting>? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so I thought, well, then good. I, I look forward to being on this panel <laughs> just for that reason alone. But. You know, the, the, the questions that have been put to the panelists are, why is Richmond still racially segregated? And what will it take for us to integrate our community? And when I read those two questions, I thought, wow, there's like 8,000 questions in between uh, the two of those. And while I didn't get to write all of them down, um, I figured that that would be um, hopefully my approach to moderating. One is to, of course, let them do their thing. And then uh, as these things uh, pop up, I will try to interject some questions and some uh, experiences. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles. And in the years when um, 
I guess uh, the, the years that I'd be thinking of <laughs> <laughs> would be uh, between uh, 19, uh, I think in my earliest you know, memories, would be from 1966 or seven um, up through high school, uh, because this was the period of transition for, uh, for, for my life, and, then, and obviously that's my reference point, right? So in 1967, I was um, uh, seven years old, so I was in the second grade. And we lived in a community uh, at that time called Manhattan Beach, California. Now Manhattan Beach now, I think, is probably more famous for having one of Tiger Woods' mansions in it at some point. But it was a white resort community. Resort communities in the 40s and 50s were not necessarily affluent. Um, it was a very small town. It was a beach town. And in fact, it had a designated black beach in the 1920s. But as is very typical, the property that they had became of interest to somebody, and so they ended up driving the community out. In 2010, I learned that they recently um, tried some reconciliation to that history and have um, placed a, uh, a sculpture there, a monument to uh, the beach that had been there and the community that had, had lived there. For me, Manhattan Beach has always been um, a very uh, powerful memory, partly because we lived with my grandparents and I had a wonderful relationship with my grandparents who went through far more than I understood as very middle class, very Aussie and Harriet, parents of a daughter who decided to marry a black man in 1960. And um, I didn't learn what they went through, what they experienced until I was grown. Um, and my uh, my own experience there sort of comes down to this moment in, uh, when I was in the second grade when I was in the chorus. In, and uh, every day after school, I would go to rehearsal. Well, there was one day when, for whatever reason, all the kids, it was really interesting, all the kids decided it was pick on me day. I mean, I was the only black child in the school. But never, for the most part, I didn't have any problem. There was one little boy who used to like to yell at me from across the, the playground, but he was one little boy, and it was like, whatever. Um, but this one day, it was like everybody decided they had to call me what they wanted to call me. And um, I got so flustered and upset that I went home. My grandmother was the one who was at home, and she, she knew what my schedule was supposed to be. And, uh, and she, it took a little doing, but she got out of me what happened. And she was livid. And she took me by the hand and she walked me back to school and my grandmother laid out every adult she could find. Um, and then I went back to choir practice and everything was fine. I don't remember any problems <laughs> ever again. Um, but I've always wondered what it was that tipped the scales that day. I don't know if it was pent up on the students' part, because you know we're all elementary school kids, but or was it pent up their parents? What had their parents been um, thinking and feeling about this family that had the nerve uh, to be there? Um, and I, you know, I won't know that. But those, that's my earliest memory of a real uh, challenge: being black in white society. And we then moved and lived in a, in a community in Los Angeles later that was so mixed that my mother then moved us out and into a black neighborhood because she thought we were just completely missing the boat. Uh, it was like too idealistic. It was pretty hippified. Um, everybody was singing folk songs and it was um, very friendly and it was really, but it was really, it was really lovely and it was in the early 70s. Um, when I came to Richmond, finally, in 1988, Richmond um, was the most segregated thing I had ever experienced in my life, um, uh, you know, barring Manhattan Beach. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I didn't understand it. When I first got here, I lived in Chesterfield County. And in Chesterfield County, I was doing landscaping. And so I was driving around to people's houses. I was married at that time. My first husband was white. And uh, being a mixed race, light-skinned black woman, is a very particular thing in segregated society. And so that is something that um, I hope will come up as a part of this conversation as well. Um, it was easy for me. Uh, it was painful to watch, but it was e people didn't give me a hard time. 
Um, and I'm since learning what some of those dynamics are, and they are, of course, related to being a light-skinned black woman married to a white guy who has a family, who has a history, and you know, I, had, I just was given the benefit of the doubt, no matter what. Um, and then when we split up and I moved in, into the city, uh, it became a lot more keener, and it's, it's one of the reasons that I became involved in the work that I do outside of William Byrd, which is the Defenders is that Richmond is this strange anomaly to me that I'm still trying to understand. And um, <coughs> I don't leave it there. That was my starting point. It's not a strange anomaly to me anymore. Virginia and Richmond are very particular places. And it isn't that they are entirely unique. Um, they're not. It, it, Richmond is, if anything, is, um, is a prototype for cities like it around the country. Um, and so I think that um, the conversation that we're going to have where these gentlemen are going to give some of their historical perspectives and contemporary perspectives on policy, on um, sociology, uh, culture. Um, the psychology piece is extremely important. And um, I'm, uh, so I am looking forward as much as you are to what they have to say and what questions um, come up out of this. Um, and one of the things that I hope that they will also do is sort of what I just did, um, and that is talk about some, one or two experiences, both in a segregated dynamic and an integrated dynamic, and how those dynamics have informed where you are today and your thinking about, about these things. So we'll go ahead, and uh, Ben, you go first talk about historical roots of segregation? Historical roots of segregation. Yes. Um, well, I did grow up with uh, a picture of Robert E. Lee on the wall in my living room. And the reason was that um, my grandfather taught at, uh, or my, yeah, my grandfather taught at Washington and Lee University, which was Washington University. And so when Lee came there after the war, they lived next door. So. He was a hero in my household, although the war was not. Um, but So I've had an interesting history growing up in a, an all-white suburb of Arlington at the time uh, with little pockets of black folks in it, um, but there was no kind of mixing of people except servants in the house. And that's, that's my beginning background. I, I will tell you my... Um, one of the great moments of my life, which uh, changed it since um, Anna has done that. I, when I was in seminary in Alexandria, it, I, uh, that's Virginia. <laughs> 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 um, I was living in a dormitory, um, and there was a guy there named Vic Lawson, who was uh, an African-American guy from Washington wanting to be an Episcopal priest, as I did. and. Um, I'm not sure I'd ever met an African-American Episcopalian before. There are some. Um, and um, so I, we were living in the same dorm. And after a while, one, one night, Vic, who's, who was engaged to Marlene, came to me and said, Marlene and I are running the young adults group for, I can't remember the church, um, big church in Washington. And, and um, we're going. Um, down river to the amusement park um, this Friday night. Uh, Going to take the Wilson Line boat from from Southwest and um, go down to uh, what was it Marshall Hall? What was the name of the place? Big big amusement park down on the Potomac, across from from Mount Vernon. And uh, would you like to come? And I said, Yeah. You know, I've always wanted to go to that amusement park, so let's do it. So he said, Meet me at uh, at the waterfront at six o'clock on Friday night so I I actually was working in the church in southwest Washington so it's very familiar to me and I went parked my car got in uh, got went on to the Wilson line boat these are the old boats that actually used to ply the the river from Richmond to Baltimore these are the last of the of the great kind of Chesapeake Bay boats were still running <clears throat> I heard the gangplank slam and I I was looking for Vic and Marlene. I walked up the stairs to the second floor. I mean, that boat was just teeming with people. And I couldn't find Vic and Marlene. And all of a sudden, I realized I was the only person that looked like me on that entire boat and that it had left the shore. I'd say there were a 1,000 people on that boat. Um, and I had never been 
in that kind of a situation. And I had this sudden interior thing happen to me, which I hate to say it because it's childhood fantasy, but I was being boiled in oil in the middle of the Congo. Uh, I, was a, I was the white explorer in, the, in an African environment, and I was terrified. And I, I really went into terror, and um, it, um, it lasted probably no more than a second or two, um, but it felt eternal and um, very archetypal. And then I saw Vic over there, and we had a great time at the amusement park. Um, but I, uh, it, the, the moment has stayed with me and informed me because I realized that was an experience that a lot of white people never have. Um, to me, it, in, in, it made me ask questions I'd never asked before. Um, gave me a sense of, of uh, the African American community as a reality, not just dark skinned white people. And um, brought me into a, a different set of questions which changed my life and has made it much more uh, interesting and exciting um, to live this, this blessed opportunity we have to, um, to do something with the world we've been given. So let me talk about the world we've been given because Richmond is a peculiar place. I, was, I loved listening to you from Los Angeles and the rest of your, um, and if you don't know the history you don't have any idea why this stuff is the way it is. There is intransigence here, there's stuff that's rooted in here that is invisible to us and functions in such a way, and I was realizing as we were talking about this, you know, I grew up in segregated Virginia. I, sometimes I meet people now in their 20s and 30s, um, you know, typically um, folks who've been to suburban um, high schools and colleges where uh, there will be 90, 95 percent white people and 5 to 10 percent people of color, various colors, not just African American, but often um, Indian and, um, and Asian. And um, they will um, say, well, you know, I live in an integrated society and have no sense of the depth of what it is we continue to be dealing with. There is a kind of a and I want them to know what we're dealing with and what folks are experiencing and what is still present and how it got this way. I want to start, um, I, I will point out that in 1607 uh, they had segregated housing in Virginia uh, because the white people were terrified. And so they built themselves forts and lived in them. And they did one down here from 1611 to 1616 at Henrico, just in six, nine miles down river. Built a stockade to protect themselves from everybody who was around. The people who came from England didn't know that they were at war. Most of them, these were just uh, folks for some reason who ended up over here in America. Um, but in fact, they were invading somebody else's country and those people were mad at them. <laughs> um, they called them savages, you know, uh, rather than people defending their country. And that's the weirdness of being white in Virginia, which starts <clears throat> right at that point. Of course, there were persons who intended the conquest. Uh, snapshot of 1676, Bacon's Rebellion, one of the least taught and most important events in American history. In Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, um, the, as you know, Jamestown was burned. You probably don't know because you probably weren't taught it. Um, but Jamestown was burned. The uh, colonial government was almost overthrown. Um, by an army that was half black and half white. Um, at that time in Virginia, there were 8,000 bonded servants. Only 2,000 were black, 6,000 were white, uh, coming out of an early period of white near slavery in Virginia. And be, this army finally surrendered at West Point, Virginia. It was half black and half white. And at the great men who are about 100 people who controlled Virginia, our democracy was composed of 100 people, by the way. That's the House of Burgesses in Virginia. Um, these people basically decided this could no longer be true. So between 1876 and 1705, they invented the Virginia Slave Code. And they invented the word white. They had used the word Christian to describe, oh, I hate this, but they used the word Christian to describe 
uh, European white people before that. They changed the word in the law, it begins to show up as white, and they created a series of laws which basically racialized slavery completely in Virginia. Um, and um, the, the language is, uh, is really very direct uh, in the Virginia Slave Codes. They're on the web, by the way, if you've never read them. It's a, a very comprehensive um, piece of legislation that, um, see if I can, but they just made sure that you knew um, who you were. And, uh, and they did things like, um, if you were, if you had a complaint, uh, the courts had to protect white servants, but they didn't have to put protect black servants. If a white servant hit a black servant, the white servant did not have to answer to a court. If a black servant hit a white servant, uh, he would automatically, on the testimony only of the white servant, um, he would be given 30 lashes. No significant economic difference between poor whites and poor blacks at that point in time, but a whole lot of very subtle things designed to create a buffer class of poor white people who would see their solidarity with the very wealthy white people um, and isolate um, the, um, the black folks. Between 1695 and 1774, it's just a very short period of time, um, Africans were, um, is the majority of the African um, immigration here, forced immigration, 114,000 people um, from 1695 to 1774 when Virginia stopped importing people from Africa officially. I, you know, it made me feel good when I first read that. I thought our liberalism had finally caught up with us, uh, but of course it wasn't that at all. There were 300,000 black persons in Virginia and 300,000 white persons in 1774 and the white people didn't want any more black people here. A, they didn't have the, the need for the labor and B, you didn't want to be in a minority. So there you are. Things stops in 1774. Right after that we had this peculiar half revolution that we had in Virginia where uh, we on the one hand uh, create this uh, free commonwealth, which is the got language in its Declaration of Independence that is the envy and an inspiration to the entire world, and at the same time, we confirm a totalitarian state for half of our population. Just, just an incredible divided spirit. The same people are creating both of those. The one little factoid that that kind of seals this for me is that when they were having trouble recruiting soldiers for the American Revolution in 1780. Um, they promised 300 acres and a slave to anyone who would sign up to fight for freedom. It didn't, you know, there was some controversy there. There were some folks who really tried to push for freedom for everybody, but it, they didn't win. Um, so what we had was a totalitarian state for half of our population with privatized control. It's privatized control. Familiar? Um, conform, controlled by a system of private ownership and enforced by the state. And by its slave system and later by its system of racial segregation, Virginia codified, institutionalized, and regulated poverty. Let me say this again. By its slave system and later by its system of racial segregation, Virginia codified, institutionalized, and regulated poverty. A state of minimal landless subsistence. No, no property ownership. Minimal landless subsistence for 40% of the population was no longer to be an accident of the economy, but a lifelong status required and justified by law. Industrial slavery then, after that, meant that African Americans, and this is what begins to happen after that, um, when um, Gabriel's revolution fails, we begin to get, and Richmond begins to grow in 1782 when it becomes the capital. Before that, it's just 500 people. By 1810, it's, it's uh, approaching um, 6,000. So, um, and Gabriel's revolution fails in 1800. So, um, then we have a period where an increasing number of, um, enslaved Africans are brought to Richmond 
rented out by their owners, many of whom do not live in the city. It's a very important moment because in Richmond between 1800 and 1860, not only is 20% of the African American population free, but the other 80%, many of them are living in a semi-free state, no longer down in the slave quarter on the plantation, but in some kind of rooming house in town, some place where they actually are not completely under somebody's eye at all times. And they are associating and going to First African Baptist Church and associating with free people. Um, so, and they are also able to earn wages for extra time. So you begin to get um, a community that has some of its own integrity and freedom um, growing in Richmond. And it's a, it's a very important movement. Um, you all know we had a, a, a civil war here and the city, <laughs> city burned. Um, you probably know that we burned it ourselves um, because we didn't want the Yankees to get it. As a matter of fact, there were two things we didn't want the Yankees to get. We didn't want them to get our munitions, so we burned our munitions warehouse. Now that takes a lot of intelligence. <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> what do you think happened? Munitions warehouse blew up, blew up the whole downtown area, including the liquor warehouse, which we also <laughs> didn't want the Yankees to get. So uh, the liquor was flowing in the streets. Um, a lot of us got drunk, and um, you know, that, that's the end of the Confederacy. <laughs> so, all right. So what's happening after the Civil War is black people are living primarily in neighborhoods of their own, um, and uh, here's how I know it um, because in 1871. The, um, the city council had five districts. This, I love this story. City council had five wards, um, and blacks were almost a majority in each of the five wards. I mean up close, like 48%, 47%. Um, and the conservatives came to power, and they decided that they needed to create a sixth ward. And so they did. And what they did was they took a pencil and they drew their line around where all the black folks lived. And they created a new ward called Jackson Ward. That's the beginning of Jackson Ward. And um, so from that point on, there was no danger um, that uh, black folks would uh, take over the city council. And uh, it went on that way. Uh, you know, they restricted voting there. By 1902, they had restricted black voting so much that they were able to go back to having an enlarged system because um, black people, you know, couldn't pay the poll tax or couldn't read the Constitution or, um, you know, there weren't enough um, polling places so you had to stay 12 hours late. Anybody <laughs> sound familiar? Okay. Um, so housing was restricted. Virginia passed a law in 1911, which was in many ways the... Um, Let's see, it's, it was a kind of model for the nation. Um, I love this. Now, there were, you know, there were, there were, um, it was pretty segregated in terms of housing patterns, but uh, the folks wanted to keep it that way. Um, and so in 1911, they passed um, what has been called the most elaborate and comprehensive racial zoning code in the nation in Richmond, 1911. Um, first major attempt to control property values using government power to separate racial groups. Of course, you know, the customs of the, of the place kept people separate, but they wanted it in law. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court threw it out six years later, um, but the city leaders kept at it, and in 1929 they passed another ordinance. And the thing I got to understand about Virginia is they never say that race is the purpose of their legislation. They always say something else. So, you know, just don't believe a word they say. The intention is generally regular, and in this case, Undertaker and Alderman Henry W. Woody, ever heard of Hen Woody's Funeral Homes? Um, he, he got a law, I love this, that says the per persons whom the state prohibits from marrying can't live next to each other. So white people are not allowed to marry black people. We have a miscegenation law in Virginia, um, and passed in 1924, and uh, but it had always been law. And, um, but that one got thrown out pretty quickly. 
So, uh, but it's still, it's still segregated housing. We have restrictive covenants in Virginia. Those of you who don't know about restrictive covenants, had plenty of them. You could put it in a deed. It says you can't sell this to a person of color uh, if, you got, if you're a white person. And um, we actually have a, a town nearby here, which is known in the vernacular as colonial whites <laughs> <laughs> because the whole town had restrictive covenants in its deeds. And those were not thrown out till you know, a couple decades ago. That was, that was basically um, a way of white people getting out of Petersburg. Um, we had redlining in the 30s uh, by the FHA. John and the University of Richmond have done some real good research on that. There's some good maps online to show you that redlining means um, you can't get a mortgage in a neighborhood that has black people in it, basically, automatically. And that's from the federal government in the um, 1930s. In 1980, uh, Richmond Urban Institute did a study under the, home, under the um, Community Reinvestment Act, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act of redlining in Richmond and found that all the major banks were redlining still in 1980. And actually, we, um, Regina and I, <laughs> were part of a group that challenged the merger of, what was it, Sovereign Bank? No, of the merger of First and Merchants Bank with Virginia National Bank of Norfolk into what became Sovereign, which was a name that lasted in the banking industry about three or four years around here. And it was actually the first challenge of the South. That's right. Thank you. And I um, actually got some money uh, to uh, hire Regina to do housing, and it's still here. Uh, yeah. But uh, the uh, Richmond newspapers put the story on the back of some page. They didn't want anybody to know. I'm serious. I mean, we had this incredible story. Mm. Okay, well, you know, you probably don't know, all of you, but um, Virginia had a uh, fully segregated education, fully segregated public accommodations. Those stories are kind of interesting. Fully segregated employment, you know, supervisory positions for black people. Can't have a black person, especially a man over a, a white woman. Um, uh, Recreation, uh, you know, we have had a black playground in Richmond. It's called Brook Field. Uh, Arthur Ice grew up playing tennis there. Um, his dad ran it, lived on it, and um, when the city wanted to build a new post office, they took Brook Field, put the post office, and killed Brook Field. Hmm. That's in 1970. Is that the main post office? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's Brook Field. That's, that's almost the same time Arthur Ice was winning Wimbledon. This stuff is far more recent than you want to know. Um, marriage, couldn't marry. Transportation was segregated. We had a streetcar boycott by black people in 1904. Big fight. Um, but, you know. So now to the present moment. 1950 to 1970. Um, basically, we had urban renewal in Richmond. All right, what's the name of the guy that, does, that put the plans out here? Harlan Bartholomew. Harlan Bartholomew did three urban renewal plans for Richmond beginning in 1940. In 1940, they already drew the expressway system, which they then carried out over the next 30 years. Um, it was already drawn. I have seen the maps. I've seen them. Bartholomew did this to 400 American cities in his period of time. He's a, a city planner who just became the guru of uh, urban renewal, or uh, we used to call it removal. Um, Every single black neighborhood in town was either destroyed or invaded. Um, the, and I'm just talking about the whole deal. And here's what, the, what happened in these, in these neighborhoods. The land, right now, just an interesting statistic, the housing in our public housing projects is three times as dense, that is in terms of the amount of land it uses, as the housing in the rest of the city. Which is an interesting fact, because in urban renewal, they took a third of the land they'd torn down houses on and put houses back on it. They took another third and used it for expressways. And they took another third and used it for vacant property where they hoped to get industrial stuff. So if you look at Chaco Valley with those uh, big wide roads down there, they wanted that for industrial stuff. If you look at Fulton, which was once a real place, um, you know, it was, in, it was designated for industrial stuff. And we have, of course, 
three major artifact roads to be looked at. One is Jackson, the I-95 through Jackson Ward. One is the Downtown Expressway. Both of those removed more than a thousand houses. The Jackson, the Jackson Ward, Richmond Petersburg Turnpike took one seventh of the of the African American population and uh, displaced it. And then you have Chamberlain Avenue, which is four, six to eight lanes wide, cutting through what was Carver and Jackson Ward. Uh, an enormous amount of destruction of land and property. Another Admiral Gravely Boulevard in Fulton, um, and um, 17th and 18th Street in Chaco Bottom. Uh, they really did the job. And um, what happened in, in place of that was the establishment of public housing. Uh, five major projects were concentrated in Church Hill, just uphill from the jail. Um, a school that was supposed to hold 2,500 students was put in the mid middle of that project in hopes that if the uh, neighborhood schools were required by the federal government, um, that would be the neighborhood. And two super highways were planned to segregate that area from the rest of the city. One was I-64, which does it. And uh, the other was the road that was supposed to go at the end of the Martin Luther King Bridge and go out to Nine Mile. However, um, a community group in Church Hill found out about that road and um, stopped it. But that would have made the complete circle around these five public housing projects in Church Hill. Richmond today, I, if I get this statistic right, um, we have a higher percentage of our population living in public housing than all but five other cities in America. That's how much public housing was done. Um, a higher percentage than all but five other cities in the country in Richmond today. Now the um, Jackson, the building of the Richmond Petersburg Turnpike was really one of the most distressing and destructive acts that I, I know anything about and I've studied it a lot and still feel like I haven't fully found my way to the bottom of it. But let me just say, uh, Gilpin Court was the first public housing project in Richmond that was in an area called Apostle Town. Uh, at the time, and there's still some saints' names on the streets over there, St. James and so on, right next to where Maggie Walker's Penny Savings Bank was. But if you will go four blocks north of the Richmond Petersburg Turnpike, you will find a pristine valley that actually connects I-95 from one end to the other, through which a single or two railroad tracks run, which is wide enough to hold two turnpikes. It is still not occupied. Um, there was absolutely no need to build that road straight through the neighborhood. It was more expensive. It displaced a tremendous number of people. But don't forget, most of those people did not own their land because ownership was not a part of the black experience in terms of property and had not been from the beginning. Um, still, most people were renters, but um, strange, strange uh, movement. Final thing I want to mention here is segregation of transportation. And I just want to explain to you how this worked because it's very important in Virginia. And remember, I said in Virginia they never say why they do it, they just do it. Um, I say they, you know, I really am sixth and seventh generation Virginian. And I just want to say my people are expert at designing laws that continue the dysfunction of the past into the present and calling it something else. And we really are good at it. And um, my father was an attorney. He used to analyze the laws, sometimes help write them. You know, this stuff is crazy. But um, in, um, in Virginia, if you want public transportation, it's up to the locality. Um, <clears throat> if you want to build a highway, the General Assembly can put it anywhere it wants. It's very important to understand. When they built the I-95 Expressway and destroyed all the black neighborhoods in town, anybody who could move, moved into the next suburb. The new, so it would be north side, it would be, I'm talking about any black person who could move, moved into the next suburb. So it would be north side, uh, it would be moving west in the west end, be moving um, towards some of the new housing in south side. 
that take they did a significant blockbusting, which anybody who's sitting here at home ought to know what it is, but it's very effective because the realtors make a whole heck of a lot of money in the process. And they, um, uh, the white folks left, fled. And they fled right across the county line. So in between 1950 and 1970, Henrico's population more than doubles. Chesterfield's population begins to expand. <laughs> Uh, until that time, Richmond had one of the, a really top public transportation system. In fact, as you probably know, uh, the trolley system, first electric trolley system in the world was here uh, under a man named, designed by a man named Frank Sprague, 10, 10 electric trolleys in 1888, began to ply the streets of Richmond, and they were excellent, and uh, it continued. Uh, only thing was the buses and streetcars were segregated by race, of course. But what happens in 1950 to 1970 is you build a system of freeways that basically are the suburban transportation in and out of the city. So it's freeways for whites and it's now public transportation for blacks. And the public transportation stops at the city line. Um, today, there's uh, uh, those of us who've been around for a long time know how strongly Chesterfield felt about stopping public transportation at the city line. Uh, Henrico has a few buses now uh, going back and forth, but if you want to try to get short pump on the bus, don't bother. Uh, the Poverty Commission is, uh, is going to address the issue of having um, a, a Metro Richmond public transportation system. We think it's one of the finest things that we could do to actually begin to break down a lot of stuff uh, uh, we know that only 25% of our jobs are accessible by bus right now, by public transportation. New kind of segregation, very effective. And it's again, um, I mean, I'm going back and looking at this thing that says, by its system of racial segregation, Virginia codified, institutionalized, and regulated poverty, a state of minimal landless subsistence for 40% of the population was no longer to be an accident of the economy, but a lifelong status required and justified by law. Now, the young men and women I work with at Armstrong High School do not have cars, do not have driver's licenses, and cannot get employment. First of all, I'm not very disciplined, and I'm used to teaching two-hour, 40-minute classes. <laughs> so I decided for your sake that I was going to write this out. And uh, I'm going to start with some actually personal stories, but I'm going to be focusing on segregation, power, and politics, and it's really going to be looking at the period from the Second World War essentially to the present. Uh, my wife Sharon and I moved to Richmond in 1970 and that's the reason and the reason is that I got a job at a new university a place called Virginia Commonwealth University. I really hadn't heard of that place. Uh, I'm serious, six months before I got the job. It didn't exist six months before you got no, the job? No, it started in 68. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now before moving, Sharon and I had worked with a fair housing organization in Montgomery County, Maryland, to desegregate the apartment building where we lived. And when we moved south to Richmond, we moved south. <laughs> um, since our commitments and beliefs moved with us, it was only natural for us to seek an integrated apartment development. Uh, we were at the point where we could uh, purchase a house. But we really weren't prepared for what we experienced. Home did not exist. Uh, we knew nothing about Richmond. Uh, we started our hunt for a place to live in a great apartment about nine o'clock or so in the morning, uh, midweek, headed toward the city along Chamberlain Avenue. Now this was a promising area since there were several apartment developments, all fairly close to BCU. Sharon and I came to the first development, 
parked there in 1968, two door, standard transmission, light blue Ford Falcon on the street, <laughs> headed off toward the rental office and asked to speak to the apartment manager. I told them we were moving to Richmond and wanted to know if blacks lived in the apartment and if they would accept black tenants. Now, since I was white and spoke with this West Texas drawl, they assumed that I asked the question because we didn't want to live in such a place. And as a result, we got very candid answers. One apartment manager said that they didn't rent to blacks, and as long as he was manager, they would never live there. So we left and went to the next, next uh, complex, spoke to that apartment manager, and left that one, and continued to drive south on Chamberlain, visiting development after development, across the river, did the same thing in South Richmond. And we began asking around if anybody knew of an integrated apartment development. And finally, someone mentioned a new development along Hull Street near Southside, Southside Shopping Center, a place called Sans Souci, although the manager called it San Chuchi, uh, the manager, though, was very pleasant, said they already had black winter uh, renters and wel welcome people from every race. So San Chuchi became our first home. Now, three years later, we started looking for our first house and were drawn to the Caroline neighborhood because it was this city's only integrated neighborhood that sought to remain integrated. Real estate agents in the neighborhood were encouraging white residents to sell their houses and move before the neighborhood became all black. The same agents would then turn around and steer black prospective home buyers to the Carillon. As more for sale signs popped up in the yards of white householders scrambling to get out, the greater the panic. Real estate businesses purchased houses at deflated prices and then turned around and sold the houses to blacks at inflated prices. Now the racially mixed Carillon Civic Association fought blockbusting. It urged white families to stay. And for those white families that had made up their mind they were going to move, then the association urged them to not plant a for sale sign in the yard. Our efforts to purchase a house in the Caroline, however, uh, were not thwarted by real estate agents. Our problem was the banks. We simply couldn't get a mortgage loan sufficient to cover the cost of the house. We went to one bank, had that problem, went to a second bank, had that problem, and our real estate agent couldn't figure out what was happening until one day when she was talking with a loan agent. One of the bank's appraisers happened by and pulled the loan agent aside and said in a muted voice that the house was in a changing neighborhood. <laughs> what was happening was that appraisers were lowballing the house value, believing it was a high risk for prospective white home buyers to locate in a mixed neighborhood. That, they claimed, would soon become all black. Their prediction was accurate, but it was the banks and the real estate industry that segregated the housing. Their prediction became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Finally, on our third try, we got a suitable mortgage loan, lived in the Caroline, and by that time, home had been created. <coughs> and since I was an early home volunteer and later board member, I, I told the staff about our experience with the banks and learned that the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department was at that time conducting a nationwide investigation of banks for precisely that kind of practice we had experienced. 
and when a Justice Department official came to Richmond, the Meesers were all too happy to testify. Despite the housing problems we experienced, we were white and benefited from white privilege. My encounters never equated to those whose skin color denied them any privilege whatsoever. In fact, they were stripped of their humanity altogether by Richmond's principalities and powers. Who were those powers? And that's really the subject of my presentation. For decades, Richmond was ruled by a very small group of top-level business and professional leaders intent on keeping neighborhoods segregated and city government under white control. Jim Crow laws proved very effective. As illustrated, it men made reference to this uh, by post-reconstruction practice of gerrymandering election districts such as that black neighborhoods were drawn into one district, obviously leaving all of the other uh, districts solidly white, 100% white. And Jackson Ward was the gerrymandered district. Its political, social, and economic exclusion, Jackson Ward's exclusion, actually led to Jackson Ward becoming a separate city altogether. Mm -hmm. But it was unlike northern ghettos. It was unlike large northern urban ghettos in that in the ghettos of the north you had lots of white business owners and they preyed on the captive black clientele. But interestingly enough, Jackson Ward began to develop its own economy, its internal economy, and actually became known as the Wall Street of black America. Jackson Ward's business and professional leaders formed the nucleus of black political organizations, the most powerful of which I'll, I'll note in, in just a moment. The development of Richmond's separate city was a product of state and local law governing zoning and land use, public accommodations, schools, local implementation of federal housing, urban renewal, and highway programs, and practices in the private sector such as restrictive covenants, redlining, block busting, and steering. In 1948, Richmond adopted a new city charter that called for a new form of government. And this whole change in the government um, was the work of this white oligarchy whose offices were clustered along Main Street and whose homes were located mostly in West End and Ginner Park. This new government abolished district-based elections for city council. There had been district-based based elections actually up to 1954 and they were replaced with at-large elections which heavily favored the business class. The legislative body of the city was reduced from 30, actually a little more uh, uh, than 30, to only nine. The popular election of the mayor was also abolished. The nine members of city council now selected a fellow council member to be mayor and control of the bureaucracy became the responsibility of a professional manager appointed by city council. Now this Richmond oligarchy maintained majority control of city council until 1977. Though the size of this majority really began to decline uh, uh, about 10 years earlier in 1966 and there were two reasons for that decline. One was the creation of a competing organization known as the Crusade for Voters, a black political group that emerged during massive resistance 
to increase African American voter registration and mobilize black voters. The leadership of the crusade was comprised largely of lawyers, doctors, ministers, university professors from Virginia Union universities, most of whom all lived in Jackson Ward. The crusade grew stronger over the years, and by the mid-60s, the crusade began to elect its own candidates to city council. But the second and really most important reason for the waning influence of this white oligarchy was white suburbanization. Thanks to new highways, FHA and VA home financing, and really the abundance of land in the counties for the building of large subdivisions, middle and upper middle income white families started to move to Enrico and Chesterfield counties. This was particularly the case after the Second World War. And the exodus accelerated when more black families began moving to Richmond from rural areas, not only in Virginia, but really throughout the South. And it also accelerated when schools were ordered by federal courts to desegregate. White suburbanization and black in-migration to the city led to a growing percent of blacks in the city population. And it was predicted in the 1960s that unless something was done to curtail this growth in the black population, that blacks would acquire a majority of Richmond's population by 1968. Enter the 1970 annexation of 50,000 whites from Chesterfield County to the city's population. And literally, at the stroke of midnight, January 1, 1970, the black percentage of the population dropped from 52% of the total to 42%. The anger of whites who had been annexed, plus even more whites angry about crosstown busing, accelerated the white exodus from the city. White suburbanization increased even more when the federal court in 1973 ordered the consolidation of city schools with those of Enrico and Chesterfield. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately overturned uh, the consolidation uh, order, but the combination of school busing, school consolidation, and the annexation triggered a 13% drop in the city's population in 10 years, from 1970 to 1980. It was enormous. It compared with the loss of population in cities like St. Louis. Now, given this enormous outmigration of whites, the continued growth of the black population, plus the effectiveness of the crusade for voters, the outcome of the 1977 city council election was historic. Blacks acquired a majority of the city council. And the new majority's first order of business was to elect Henry Marsh as mayor, becoming the first black mayor in Richmond's long history. But catch this, shortly after Richmond acquired the city, where concentrated poverty was skyrocketing, social service needs were soaring, school funding was growing ever weaker, the amount of vacant development whole land was disappearing, the tax base was plummeting, and economic development needs were increasing. At that very moment, the state legislature stripped the city of its power to annex. And the consequence is that today, the city's land mass is fixed at 62 <coughs> square miles. Meanwhile, Henrico encompasses 238 square miles, Chesterfield 434 square miles, and Hanover 468. The loss of annexation powers occurred when Richmond's suburbs became more than bedroom communities to the city. The suburbs themselves became separate cities. Places where people worked, shopped, attended school, saw the doctor, attended worship, prepared their car, banked. 
Now blacks too uh, began to move to the suburbs thanks to the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Initially, black suburbanites were uh, upper middle professional black families. But later, after the turn of the 20th century, an even greater number of blacks moved. These were poor blacks who had been displaced in the city by gentrification and found lower <coughs> rents in the deteriorating older suburbs nearest the city, suburbs that once were white. High density poverty in the inner suburban ring today is rising as white professionals move back to the city to live in downtown apartment buildings converted from abandoned warehouses and offices and reside in renovated houses in the historic neighborhoods of East End and Northside Richmond. In just the past five years, these changes have led to increases in Richmond's white population. It's led to increases in Richmond's household median income. Black population is declining. The city is only 1% away now from being majority white. Now on the other hand, the suburbs minority population is becoming a majority population. The whole social geography of the Richmond metropolis has changed. Editorial cartoonist Tom Tolles of the Buffalo News captured so well these epic shifts in the United States over the past century. And the title of this editorial cartoon is The Plan. And the cartoon consists of six frames. In frame one is a sketch of the city where the majority of whites live. In frame two, minorities move to the city. In frame three, whites move to the suburbs. In frame four, whites move farther out to second ring suburbs. In frame five, minorities move into first ring suburbs. In the final frame, whites move back to the city. And the final caption reads, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> now, I really don't put much stock in conspiracy theories. <laughs> Reality is too complex and power is too fragmented for some kind of grand conspiracy to emerge. But, but really, Tom Tolles presented an inescapable truth, which is that, as a rule, whites move out when too many blacks move in. Much has been written and said about the underlying issue of our day, whether the most significant problem is class or whether it is race. In Central Virginia, it is both. Class and race are joined at the hip. Just look at the demographics. Areas of economic boom are overwhelmingly white. Areas of greatest decline are overwhelmingly black and Latino. Moreover, in the Richmond area, the income gap between blacks and whites is getting larger, not smaller. Racial segregation in metropolitan Richmond is troubling enough, but when one superimposes city-county separation on top of racial segregation, then segregation becomes even more pernicious. Whole jurisdictions become defined by race. And anyone who thinks that the strained relationships between Richmond and the counties have nothing to do with class and race are either living in a state of denial or are grossly out of touch with reality. Exhibit A is the controversy that arose several years ago over the extension of bus service into Chesterfield County. The most common expression of many whites living in Chesterfield was that extended bus service would bring, quote, the city out to the suburbs, end quote. The city is a code word. It's not difficult to interpret. There is great fear that buses will increase crime. I really love what 
Dr. John Kenney, the Dean of the School of Theology at Virginia <laughs> University, at Virginia Union University, really recently said at a minister's conference held at uh, Richmond Hill, he was talking about perceptions that the bus will increase suburban crime. He said that residents of poor neighborhoods are used to drive-by shootings, but have you ever heard of a drive-by in a bus? <laughs> <laughs> or have you ever heard of a person who rides public transit out to the mall to steal a large screen TV and then makes his escape by first stopping at a bus stop? <laughs> Now, in the midst of these enormous changes in social geography, the question I have is, will suburban and Latinos organize politically, as did black populations in the mid-1950s? <coughs> the reins of political power ever be in the hands of population who once were confined to Richmond's separate city? Will we ever have a city that encompasses not 62 square miles, but 800 square miles, the combined land mass of the city, Chesterfield, Henrico, and Hanover? It certainly won't happen by annexation. But could it ever happen because the city and counties resolve to act like a single city that they in fact have become? More importantly, will white Richmonders and Richmonders of every race and nationality, Richmonders of every level of income, will we ever come to recognize our common humanity? Will we ever start to build neighborhoods welcoming to everyone? Will we, have, will we ever have neighborhoods that post another kind of do not enter sign at the end? one that applies to the powers and principalities intent on segregating us rather than uniting us. Thank you, John. Well, I was so much into listening to you, I... I hear it. Want to come back to me? Can we come back? <laughs> In all seriousness. Um, well, I want to begin by, I guess, telling you who I am and, and a little bit of my story in terms of having been brought up in segregated communities. And I want to have more, hopefully, more of a dialogue. I'm, I'm kind of like, if you look at a box, I'm like a counterpuncher. I, I prefer <laughs> to kind of mix it up and, and uh, go from there. But I, I think that um, my story is quite, uh, in my mind, unusual in terms of my the, the revelations I've come to as an adult based on childhood events, um, particularly as it concerns the messages I got from my parents. My, my parents, my mother's from Fairville, North Carolina, and my father's from a place called Dorchester County, South Carolina. They were born in the 20s, 21 and 20, and they moved to New York in the 30s, as many black folk did. So it's important to know that my early socialization is coming from a context of racial, racial segregation from the South, um, and understanding those dynamics. And it was only as an adult that I could reinterpret some of the actions of my parents um, in relation to segregation. I grew up in, in, as was mentioned, in a place called St. Albans, New York. St. Albans is quite an affluent black community on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> Where I lived, it was just a black community. <laughs> but, but many uh, black entertainers that you're familiar with, um, Louis, uh, um, Armstrong, uh, James Brown, uh, Count Basie, they owned homes in St. Albans, New York. Um, <laughs> but it was a very segregated community, as was St. Albans where I lived. Now, uh, the school was about five blocks from my house. I could walk to school, um, and it was a middle class community and you know, a relatively decently resourced school. But my, my mother chose to have me bust to a white school in the first grade. That was way across town. Um, and, and I don't remember having any negative experiences early on, but, but that wasn't really the point. Uh, the point in terms of my adult interpretations of her behavior to bust me away from my community 
um, was that she understood where the resources would be directed. That it wasn't the idea that she thought I would learn more being around white folk, but she knew that that's where the resources would be directed. And I think that at some point, um, parents don't really articulate these things to children. And many times, these uh, behaviors can be misinterpreted and perhaps result in the internalization uh, of um, <laughs> so some, some negative self-concept issues. But I, I think my mother understood the resource <laughs> allocation along racial lines and community and residential segregation and how that affected my opportunities. And so she sent me to a white school in, um, uh, in Queens. And so I didn't have problems until my second or third year. And I began to protest actually in the fourth grade that I wanted to come back to, the, to a black school. And they built a brand new school, middle school, near my home. And so my mother finally relented and I was going uh, back to the community to go to school. Um, and this was a predominantly black and Latino school. Uh, obviously a consequence of residential segregation. And um, I did rest of my, the rest of my uh, middle school years there. And then we moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina, my mother's hometown. My father passed away in the interim and she wanted to be near family to raise me. Um, mm. I wasn't that easy to be raised. <laughs> so she needed some assistance. <laughs> and we moved to Fayetteville. Wow. And, and here is when she made another decision that she thought would enhance my life chances mm. based on her understanding of the racial dynamic of resource allocation. We sold our house in Queens. And this was, this was interesting because this is what made us middle class. My parents owned a home. My mother worked for a white family in Manhattan, and my father was a, uh, a laborer for the New York City transit system. Right? In other, in other worlds, that would be working poor, uh, if not poor. But because uh, we owned a home, we were middle class and lived in a middle class community. So we sold the home and moved to Fayetteville. And that allowed my mother to buy a new home. And this time, she chose to buy a home in a white community, literally in an all white community. And then this became, uh, as I would later learn, kind of uh, bragging rights. Um, not uh, out loud, but amongst family, I could hear them uh, bragging about living in a white community. What year was that? This is, uh, he wants to know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is 1976, 1977, Fayetteville, mm. North Carolina, which is another planet altogether. <laughs> but, but we moved to a white community in Fayetteville. Um, and we didn't have any, any uh, overt acts of, of hatred, anything like that. Now, there were a few occasional incidents in which I had forgotten my key and was trying to get in my own house. They called the police on me, the police had me in the car. <laughs> and they asked a neighbor, does he live there? She said, I think that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like 12 years old. So. Uh, it was a pretty scary moment, but, but it wasn't any open hostility. Um, one time I had a friend come over, a, a white classmate come over, and he was baffled that I lived there. He couldn't believe that I lived there. And I could tell that he didn't, had never been to a black person's home, and the, his expectations were, were kind of uh, not met. But other than that, <laughs> I didn't have any hostilities in my neighborhood. At school, it was a different story, though. Um, and, and I think that at my school, the only black kids at my school were kids who were bust to my school. And, and they would ridicule me for living in a white neighborhood. So and that will bring me to another point later in terms of uh, I'll be asking the right question about segregation. But um, when I left Fayetteville, grad school, da 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 da, I come back this way. Now, my first time in Richmond, right, for more than an hour or drive through was when I came to VCU. I had never been here before. Um, so I called a realtor. I came from Howard University. Um, to BCU, and I called a realtor and they drove me around. And so I didn't know where I was, but I know the house I liked. <laughs> it was later I discovered that I was in Chester and it was a history in Chester, and, you know, so it was too late by this time. <laughs> but, but here is, I, I guess, my, my point is, is that this, these phenomena have followed me, and I, I'm clear that they've not gone away. It's still very plain. Um, when I moved into my house, it was a new construction. There was a wooded area on this whole block was wooded area, and there were houses on the other side of me. I was clearly the only black person on that block at the time. And they would later construct 
three houses right across from me on a shared driveway. There'd be three houses constructed. The first house was sold to a, a black military family, husband and wife. It took about six months after the house was constructed for the sell. The second house in the middle was sold maybe a year later to a single uh, black woman of Caribbean descent. The third house on the end took three years to sell. And eventually a black family moved in there. Now it could be a coincidence <laughs> that around my house, the only black people in the neighborhood live one, two, three, and me. <laughs> it could be a coincidence. <laughs> That's what happened. And we were like in, 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 in a little, a little corner of Harlem. <laughs> and, and, and no one's been like mean spirited or no crosses burned or any nasty letters left. Um, but it's just very plain that, that these things still exist and that there's anxiety about real estate values and such. And so it, it's still very prevalent there in my life. And I see it and I'm reminded of, of every day when I go home and greet my neighbors. Now, the question we have to ask, and I probably anticipated what the direction of tonight's discussion would be, and, and certainly we're going in that direction, but as I always some try, sometimes try to do is to ask another question, and perhaps ask, are we asking the right question? And I want to ask, if we ask the question, what are the negative consequences of residential segregation for African Americans, don't we kind of construct the answer? Right? Why don't we ask him what are the consequences for whites? You see what I'm saying? Is it just black folk that are segregated? No. White folk have to be segregated, but us, you know, in order for us to be segregated as well, what are the negative consequences of residential segregation for whites? I, I think that question uh, is never asked. Now certainly there are consequences. What do you think some of the consequences might be um, for white folk in Richmond? Of segregation. Residential segregation. Anybody? Just thought. Lack of perspective. Lack of perspective. Certainly. I live in Chesterfield. And we don't have a bus going anywhere. And it is becoming absolutely unlivable because country roads are turning into six lane boulevards. Um, it's, it, it, I, I just want to get the hell out of it. It's awful. And uh, this is the future of these suburbs because of this segregation. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think, as, I'm a psychologist, as was, as was noted. And, and, and there's this process when people have kind of uh, phobia, phobias, in this case, negrophobia. <laughs> and they have irrational fears, right? Or, or generalized anxiety. Mm -hmm. There is a technique called flooding uh, that you do is you expose people to that what they fear and the fear goes away, right? And, and we can argue that, that white folk in the country have this, this irrational fear of black folk, almost a paranoid delusion of what will happen should they move in, right? And, and these, this continuous segregation perpetuates or, or doesn't provide opportunities to disabuse white folks of those fears and anxieties. So folk begin to build higher walls, bigger fences. Right. And in fact, when I was at Seton Hall, my first academic uh, position, a uh, small Catholic University in South Orange, New Jersey, which is an incredible place. Maplewood and South Orange are way ahead of the curve on desegregation. They had uh, community boards whose title included uh, racial reconciliation and desegregation. In the title, they didn't try to dress it up multicultural committee. They didn't dress it up. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were real about it. And they were working with their agents to make sure there was no steering and what have you. I really enjoyed living there. It was on the, the, the border, my house is on the border of Newark. And, and South Orange, Newark, Maplewood was up the street. Maplewood had a lot of celebrities up there. And so there was two Maplewoods. There's always two of everything. <laughs> <laughs> there's the one with the real money, and then there's the other one that you can claim association if you live there. <laughs> but, but they were real about it. Now at Seton Hall, this was a small Catholic university, and they were fenced in. It was almost like you could feel and sense the anxiety that they had about being close to Newark. And certainly students would have occasional problems with folk, but it was more about this expectation of, in both camps that 
kind of fed these problems. And so I think that when you, when you observe the anxiety in white America, right, about the encroachment of, in their space of black people, you get a sense of, of, of this ease in terms of folks aren't at peace, you see? And, and you can't find peace if you don't create opportunities to flood, to disabuse oneself of this unrealistic fear, this irrational anxiety. Um, and so I think that that's an example of what happens when we don't ask the question, what are the effects of segregation on white Americans, right? It's a privilege not to have to ask that question, but there are consequences with those privileges. So, Sean, I, could, could I just give one little answer to that that has worked on me, because I think it's really, like in many ways, the question um, around race. But in, in doing the work I've done, um, the effect on, on white education of segregation, the segregated schools has really overwhelmed me. Um, the, um, you could not teach economics or political science or real history in any Virginia university, any white Virginia university, until the beginning of the 70s. Um, our, our General Assembly today, anyone um, in their uh, a little over 50 has, was raised on textbooks that had no mention of black people. The, um, the, you can't take, talk about economics because you can't talk about exploitation or slavery. You can't talk about history because you can't talk about the deliberate uh, policies of the state. You can't talk about politics because you can't talk about the absolute obsession with um, racial segregation. So white people, in fact, are uneducated fundamentally um, in the in a picture of the world that might give a comprehensive picture. A second problem. Certainly, we could sit here all night and, and, and dissect the, the many problems that, that occur out of this paradigm. But let me just deal with the question that we've come here to deal with. What are the consequences of uh, segregation for black folk? And I think we often begin with faulty assumptions. The assumption is, is that it's negative, right? That the consequences are negative. And in fact, we may even be familiar with data that suggests it's negative. We may even refer to the Brown v. Board of Education case and the famous Clark Dahl studies and the Clark testimony that indicated that black children were being irreparably harmed by segregation and not being allowed to go to school white children, right? And, and so people often quote the Clark. Kenneth Clark was a black psychologist uh, who, whose work and whose testimony before the Supreme Court um, made the case for Thurgood to show empirical data that it was harming children. Actuality, Mamie Clark, his wife, was the author of the study. <laughs> it was a master thesis at Howard University. Uh, but Kenneth, you know. Uh, <laughs> You see that in. But, oh, that's hysterical. But, but what happened though is, is, is Kenneth Clark selectively presented the data. Let me share with you the data that he didn't present to the Supreme Court. And you'll understand why uh, he did. Now, in his uh, research protocol, he would show the children doll, dolls and ask them questions. Which one's the prettiest? Which one's the beautiful? Which one do you want to be like? Which one's bad? Which one's ugly? Which one smells? Which one's dirty? Those kind of questions. Now, the first responses for questions one through four uh, indicated that racial preferences actually revealed a lesser percentage of outgroup preferences among southern children who attended segregated schools than northern children who attended racially mixed schools. For example, 37% of segregated children compared to 28% of integrated children preferred to play with brown dogs. 46% of segregated children compared to 30% of integrated children believe the brown doll is nice. 49% of segregated children compared to 71% of integrated children said that the brown doll looked bad. And 20% of segregated children compared to 37% of integrated children felt that the brown doll had a nice color. So this is actually data from Clark's studies that he didn't present to the Supreme Court. Obviously, it wouldn't have made this case. Now, psychologists or all social scientists and others present data sometimes selectively. It's not a good idea, but we do it. 
<laughs> if it doesn't make the case, then we probably won't talk about it. But these are data to suggest that, in fact, children living in segregated schools uh, had higher self-concept than folks believed them or wanted to perceive them as having. Now, we have to disentangle the political from the social behavioral science. Politically, it made sense to, to uh, dismantle segregation, right? As a legal construct, it made sense, right? And you had to make a social behavioral argument to appeal to the moral capacity of the country to convince folks to do that. That was the strategy. But you sometimes can't mix the two. Okay, so politically I can agree that I should have a right to live and go to school wherever I want to. But I may also have a preference in where I live and go to school, right? And the messages I get in the areas of preference might be different than the ones you get in some places that don't validate your existence, right? So I think that we, we can't pretend that the political and the social psychological consequences um, are necessarily neatly disentangled. You follow me? Yep. All right, now, now that was simply the beginning. And uh, Clark's studies were in the 50s, began in the 40s. She defended around 51, I think, and it was presented before the Supreme Court. But since that time, other researchers have looked at the same question over the decade that followed. And they also found that segregated schools produce children with higher self-esteem, right? Because the theory suggested, and they justified or, or tried to explain this, in that the blacks who lived in segregated schools tended to be isolated from discrimination and, and, and kind of uh, the hostility of uh, predominantly white environments. And so therefore, they had no clue that somehow they were ugly or less attractive or perceived as not as good as other folks. And here's a personal anecdote that, that really broke my heart and, and uh, having a uh, discussion with my son. And I don't know where he gets these things from or who tells him to say it, but I don't have answers for him. Um, but he is clear of the advantages of being white. And, and said one day that if he were white, then he could do what he wanted to do. I tried to, 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 to delve and see where he got that notion from, gently. But I didn't want to kind of, uh, this, is, this, is, this is me as a parent, not as a psychologist trying to be gentle with what I know is a, a, a deep fragmented psyche of all Americans, but particularly black Americans. And so uh, not wanting to give him cues, but also trying to understand where he got that message from. Mm -hmm. But the message is in the environment. Kids see that. I heard President Rao at BCU say this about his kids. And, and I was like, why are you saying that public? I thought that he, he was very brave in, in, to say that he himself has watched his kids struggle with white privilege at school. He did this to my psychology faculty at BCU. But I think that we delude ourselves by, by thinking that these messages aren't in the environment. And with regard to segregation, I think for black folk, we have to weigh the consequences and the benefits of integration. You see, from a political uh, perspective in which uh, folk want to do good and see good happen, it's a no-brainer. But for the folk who have to then negotiate those environments in which there may be some hostility, there may be messages that aren't, conform, that aren't uh, 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 affirming for, for us, and more importantly for our children, for whom we invest so much in protecting, right, and trying to shape them and give them a chance. And, and, and so we have to make decisions about where we want to live. So the question is, or the point is, is that self-segregation is a phenomenon that I don't think we've considered tonight. And I think that we also have to disentangle segregation that's self-selected and that's unattached to poverty, right? And that, that is a consequence of poverty and kind of externally imposed. Because there are many black communities that I've encountered in my entire life that are self-imposed, that are wealthy, middle class, highly functioning black communities where black folks choose to live. You see, because these parents perhaps themselves have negotiated white environments to get where they have gotten economically and understand that they don't want their children to be exposed to some messages, right, that they will encounter in their efforts, as my parents did, to take me where the resources were, right? My parents understood that there were consequences, 
You see, but these are the kind of decisions that black folks have had to make, make since we've been here in terms of even when I was doing this oral history on the uh, school closings, right? There were children who were, whose parents, who the NACP put up to kind of integrate schools. Think about that. Would you want your child to, to have to be that child who integrated the school? A five or six or seven year old, right? So parents understand that, that they have to kind of expose their children to risk in order to increase their life chances. But when we don't have to do that, we prefer not to. So in terms of segregation, when it's internally imposed, it's tied to poverty, there are different problems with that, right? But there may be strengths inherent in that situation as well. And we can't always make things so neatly compartmentalized as either it's pathological or it's healthy. There are strengths inherent in pathological situations, um, but when we have black communities that are vibrant and thriving, who are self-selecting to segregate. Um, I don't know if we want to pathologize that. Now, thinking about Richmond and Jackson Ward, I had the opportunity to have some contact with a place uh, in Tulsa called Greenwood. Greenwood is the original Black Wall Street. Um, Greenwood was a consequence of a very interesting dynamic between Native Americans and black people that we don't talk about. Uh, but when the Native folk were run out of North Carolina and South Carolina um, and sent on the Trail of Tears, right? Guess what they took along with them? Now we like to say out oh, their wives, their black wives and husbands. No, they took their enslaved Africans with them, right? Of course there were some that were married, but they took their property with them, their enslaved Africans with them. And the government required them to incorporate them into their new sovereign nation. So that's why you have black people who are, who were technically members of the Cherokee Nation or the other civilized tribes. I'm not making these words up, this is what they call a civilized tribe. The Cherokee, the Creek, and some others, you probably know better than I do. And there was recently a vote, maybe five years ago, by the Cherokee Nation to expel those black people who were included in the Doors Index, which is that holy grail of inclusion in the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokee Nation voted to, to toss them out. But I was in Tulsa when this was happening. And Tulsa, the black people in Tulsa came there for different reasons than black folk find themselves in Richmond. And they happened to come there at a time right before the oil boom began to happen. And as a consequence of the oil boom um, and the trickle down effects of that wealth and segregation, black folks were, had a thriving community with over 155 black owned businesses. This is where uh, uh, John Hope Franklin, the famous story from Duke, this is where his family is from. Um, in fact, his father was the attorney uh, in the Tulsa race riots case many years later. But now, the magic of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, which is probably the same in Richmond, is that the, the dollar in the black community was turning over multiple times, right? Black folks were having to spend their money, money with each other, so it became a socialization of, of this kind of self-sufficient economy, right? There were funeral homes, there were, there were cleaners, there was the movie theaters, there were attorneys, there were doctors. Um, incredible wealth in this community. So much so that the white community became resentful. And they devised a plan to seize the resources of that community. And they created a fictional event in which a black man named uh, um, ah, Dick Rowland uh, had allegedly molested a white woman on the elevator during broad light. Or daylight. They were going to lynch this man. Right? But check this out. Six or seven black men got their guns <laughs> and went down to the courthouse to prevent them from harming Dick Rowe. That's unimaginable in the, in the minds of most Americans, black or white. <laughs> but that's what these black men did. Now think about the audacity of them. What were they thinking? But that's the, 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 that's the mind frame of black people who are invested right, and their communities. Um, that demonstrates, and this is a segregated community, I would trade that one for any integrated community today, whereby the psychological outcomes of that community was that, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> I'm getting my gun and we going down there and we're stop this. And they did that. And there was a struggle for the gun, the gun went off, long story short, both sides retreated, right, the black folks 
went to the church tower and, and, and took up arms and positions and the white folks gathered in mass and at midnight the bell rung and the white folks began to invade. The first 14 people to die were the whites who were shot by the black folks in the tower. The black white folks retreated and regrouped, came back having deputized every white man in this town in mass and decimated 30 square blocks of this black community. They were flying airplanes and dropping incendiary devices from the airplanes um, on the black community. They were doing reconnaissance from the airplanes for black folks who were fleeing. They deputized every white man. The National Guard was called out and they were rounding up every black man and, and turning them. So we think that the Japanese were the first folk in turn. No, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they interned every black man and the only way to get, get freed is if a white person, his employer or some white person vouched for them. And then they were given a badge that they wore, that they had been vouched for and were able to walk around free. Now this is following World War I, 1919, 1921 is when the riot happened, but following World War I, black folk were different. And so segregation in this context had other implications. It had implications that perhaps we can learn from, right? So it's really important to understand that it's not necessarily the, the segregation itself, but it's kind of the environment that develops, evolves out of that situation. And that if you have a, a situation that's healthy, it doesn't really matter if it's all, if it's segregated, integrated, or what. You see? But I think that we have a model in our minds of the consequences of segregation, the psychological consequences, which are detrimental to black folks, and we're trying to find ways to explain uh, things that we can't explain with other kinds of logic. We look at the performance in schools, and we think about perhaps segregation is impacting the, the children, not that the resources being allocated need to be uh, reallocated in a way that's fair, right? But somehow inherent in that, in that data is that something is wrong with those black children, right? And if we could only get them around white children, they would do better. <laughs> that's the argument for the Supreme Court. That has a left us, folks. We have to understand that these kinds of messages, these messaging, they're hard to leave. They, 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 they take many, many, many years to incorporate, right? in a, a new law or a vote by the Supreme and, and, and people are free to choose to live where they like. Yes, sir. I, I hear what you say, but one of the strangest conversations I've ever had, I, I lived for 15 years in Chicago, which is perhaps this nation's most segregated city. And uh, I was in the south side of Chicago in uh, at a black Catholic church, and I approached a 14-year-old uh, uh, black uh, young male, and it was evident he was very uncomfortable talking to me. And after chatting for a while, he finally said, "You are the first white person I've ever talked to." This is 1990s in the United States of America, and uh, I couldn't believe it. And uh, he didn't know, how, I mean, it, it, he was struggling with, how, how do you talk with white people? And uh, I, 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 you know, saw one of the real limitations to pure segregation. Mm -hmm. And see, I, I, I that's, that's, an, that's a very good example to illuminate, again, how this is really an issue of resources. Right? The only reason that's an impediment for him is because he will probably have to go to white communities, white businesses, for opportunity. He's got to live in the world. Right. Uh, a white person doesn't have to make that same accommodation. You follow me? <laughs> they don't have to learn how to be comfortable around black people because they will never have to do that. They can choose to do that, right? So this is an example of how it's not really this person who is underdeveloped. It's a system that, that has two standards. So a white person doesn't have to learn to be comfortable around black people. Because they don't have to go to black folks for a job, to black folks for a school, to black folks to do business. In fact, they can avoid black folks if they choose to do so. But that black person can. Now imagine a world in which uh, he was living in Greenwood in Tulsa. 
perhaps he didn't have, perhaps he'd have other options. Now I'm not saying that on a basic human uh, kind of uh, utopian level that we should all get along and be able to kind of enjoy it. I, I wish, but I'm saying that in a basic reality, you see two people who have completely different options, and that same question or scenario doesn't have to cannot be applied to a white person because they have the option not to have to be comfortable around black folks. And many times they exercise that option. Yes, Another layer I hear to what you're talking about, which may warrant a whole other panel, is the socioeconomic one. Mm -hmm. And you see socioeconomic segregation throughout the counties, and especially with the uh, real estate development in the last 20 years, they are segregating uh, you know, price by price point uh, entire neighborhoods and separating the price points. So they will not put, uh, you know, they will not mix the price points within the same, you know, block or, or section of a neighborhood, and they'll even call them different names to even highlight that this is the higher end section of the subdivision. Uh, so even though they may be racially diverse at this point, um, social economically, people are segregating themselves by that. So throughout your stories, I'm also hearing that there's this fight between the the haves and haves nots, and that transcends race, and so. I, I'm hearing that there's a battle as soon as any, as soon as any um, uh, group is thriving, the people who are not are trying to tear them down, and we see that throughout politics now. Uh, and there's that whole division too within the cities, within the counties, and that transcends the the racial issues. Uh, and that fact, anyone's it. undermining. Clarify point in terms of my my family and client experience. My mother, being from the South, <laughs> she knew the white neighborhood she wanted to move to. So it's not just a white neighborhood; it's a particular kind of white neighborhood she moved to. But certainly, there are white people that she wouldn't want to be around either. Right. So it's really a class issue <laughs> as well. So it's important to see white folks. Uh, but I think that that there lies a problem. That that the internalization of these ideas and notions. Uh, of, uh, of value uh, for black folks has led us to behave in ways that are counter to our uh, interest. And, and so we would rather, and you hear stories about how I moved out the hood and started doing better, and, and, and we don't understand how these used to be communities. You know what I'm saying? If you think about Harlem and the, the famous people we know and read who live in Harlem, it wasn't the place that you were, were, were made afraid of in the 70s and 80s, this, this was a thriving community with people who were major figures who, who had a thick and poly, you could see them on a you know, wave. And so we understand that communities that used to exist are very different than those that exist today. So you can't really disentangle some other societal pathological conditions that everybody's experiencing, right? And how that interacts with segregation, right? So it's, it's it really is uh, perhaps difficult to transpose that Tulsa or that uh, Jackson Ward to today because we're dealing with a bunch of other layers of stuff that, that makes it difficult to have thriving communities um, as we once had. Oh, I'm going to jump back in because I know that we're probably close to that part. I, I also believe that it's really the questions and the dialogue that's coming from you all. I literally don't know what time it is now, so um, I think we're close to 8.30, is that right? So I don't know if, if you all have the, the wherewithal to hang in there for another 10 or 15 minutes so that we can maybe get some more questions. Um, but I, I wanted to raise just a couple of things. One is that I almost was entirely unnecessary here, only because um, they covered a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that I was thinking about, and you know, obviously there's a historical trajectory um, as we are trying to correct um, our education, correct what we know about the history of Virginia, correct what we know about our racial history, and the fact that it is absolutely you know a part of every aspect of the history of Virginia. And I work in a little tiny library that um, was started by Grace Ahrens. And Grace Ahrens was a benefactor in the city, and she was the niece of Louis Ginter. And this is big money and big, 
you know, stuff, but we actually have small pieces of her library still there. And I remember pulling out every now and then I come across one of these really, really old books. And there's one there that's a history of Virginia where black people simply do not exist. And the only way that Indians exist is to talk about um, the hope that they were going to be able to civilize the savages and then it just didn't work out. So, <laughs> so then they disappear from, from the history as well. Um, one of the things that immediately occurred to me when I was asked about this, uh, to, to participate in this panel, was do we, do we know what we're asking when we say we want to in integrate our communities? What do we really want? Ooh, what really do we want? Are we just saying we want to look around and see you know, a perfect mix of everybody who's coming to Richmond because you know, we'll feel good when we're watching TV and you know, it's like, if you remember the United Colors of Benetton? That was like the first major you know, PR campaign to make us look like a multicultural, young, and gorgeous society, right? And, um, but when we really think about it and when I start thinking about things, I mean, the hardest time I've had tonight is listening to Sean talking about being a parent of children in this dynamic. And I have gone through real gyrations in, in Richmond going, I wish I had the guts to leave Richmond and raise my children someplace else. Because <clears throat> I, have, I have two boys. I have a one boy from my first marriage, which was to a white man. And so my son was white. He's half black and half white. That's, that's what happened in that instance. My second son is the product of a relationship with a black man. He looks black. <coughs> and their experiences in Richmond have been profound and very frustrating. Um, but that's okay too because they, you know, we all have to learn a lot of things and we live in a society now where we're so busy trying to protect our children, they're not learning a lot of things. But, um, you know, my older son has always had to deal, interestingly enough, once they see me, with trying to figure out if maybe because he's white there's something inherently racist about him. So people would push on him to see if he would break bad and like say the N-word or do something like that. My other son is growing up um, finding out, uh, because we are in the city and going to schools, these schools are primarily black. But they seem to suffer from this dynamic that Sean is talking about of being uh, sort of encased in, in, in maybe what we would call an integrated city, but the dynamic of this profound loss of, uh, of, of sense of, um, of, of not pride, sorry, I'm losing the word, but you know, sense of person, sense of an entitlement to occupy the space you occupy and be proud to walk around. When we go to DC, the air changes completely because there is a historically strong black community you can still feel. And so black people, as a generalization, I feel like they walk around comfortable in their skin. When I went to West Africa, I was in a default environment that was African are comfortable in there. You know, but people are not freaking out, worrying about how they're relating to white people. Now, I'm saying that as an American because there is a whole other European colonial dynamic that Africans are, you know, are, are living with and dealing with. But what really concerns me about all of what we've been talking about is that if you notice, we're able to go way back in our history to talk about some of the origins of these dynamics and who, has, who this has been detrimental to. It has been detrimental my father used to say to me, if white people had only understood how enslaved they were by this history, that this would be a very different <coughs> place that we live in. <clears throat> but it's the fact that it's very contemporary, that we are living in it right now. And the decisions that we make, like the city council and you know, and all these kind of things that are happening, you know, all of what you described in terms of what happened politically, we watched L. Douglas Wilder contribute to the flipping over of uh, the power dynamic in the city of Richmond. He changed it back, you know, he campaigned and said he wasn't interested in running for mayor, but now we have an at-large mayor process. And so, yes, our first two mayors have been black, but city council now only has two black representatives as of this election. So now we're in a majority, minority representation in a city where we may only be, you know, a, a, a one percentage, two percentage points away from becoming a minority population. But again, as, as has been described, what are the living contexts? What are the living dynamics that we are all going to have to process as we are living in our history right now? And 
And so we really have to pay attention to these decisions. You know, uh, same thing where you know it's one thing to say you can or cannot vote. It's easy to fight that. You should have the right to vote. Everybody should have the right to vote. But then, what do you do with that power? How do you exercise that power? The power of voting, the power of not voting, the power of making these choices and paying attention. When I, and this is the last thing I'm going to make before I open it back up, I was contacted uh, almost immediately after saying that I was going to participate in this by someone who's working on school desegregation up in Northern Virginia. And he sent me, I must have been 15 or 20 documents, and I don't know if he's in the room or not. Is there a friend, Fred Millard in the room? By any chance? Um, but, <clears throat> but he was uh, uh, passionate, uh, I mean fervent, in his uh, belief that there was a need to uh, look, at, to push reintegration of schools from a socioeconomic base. And he just pushed and pushed and pushed. And he, you know, sent, he sent me some things. And this apparently is a document that represents a Virginia legislative proposals, integration achievement gap. And it goes on, I mean, lots of studies, lots of studies, but as you know, studies can be, you know, selective. Um, but, but it seems, I read this, and I heard enough of what he had to say for me to realize that he believes that integration will solve our problems. And that it is terribly important that we integrate all our schools. And not only that, that we do it by moving children around again. It's about busing again. It's about redistricting again. And all of that spoke to me, though, was that we are also now beginning to hear more and more from people about what the experiences have been to live through <coughs> these policies. So if we are not paying attention to our own actual experiences and, and the people around us and really listening to each other and really understanding what the experiences is, are on the ground, um, then it's very difficult to make any smarter decision than we have made in the past. Um, and I, I, I would like to, um, you know, I'd like to encourage you just to sort of you know, hear that. I, mean, yeah, I, was, I was a little freaked out when I read the document as well because of this idea that once again we have to move, we have to force people to do things. We have to force people to change their personal lives in order to meet a public notion of what the solution is as opposed to you know, really addressing on the ground what it is that we have to do. Um, and so on that note, uh, questions, any more questions or thoughts? Stand up. Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, I guess everybody's kind of touched on this tonight. <coughs> the idea that we have inherited a institution for the past hundred years that's based off of rich white men predominantly and their kind of ideas. And now we're living in the 21st century, but we're still living <coughs> with these institutions that were created by by these specific ideals and white supremacist notions that you were saying. And I think it's important to recognize that. And so when you recognize that and realize that the creation of this entire country, and also at the local level, is based off of white supremacist ideas, how do you, how do you move out of a system? I, I find it difficult for us to be able to move out of a system into something different based off of the old. So. I like what you were saying where we should focus on resources and focus on, I guess, creating somewhat of an alternative to provide for people and not focus on integration and busing, but more of being able to provide for people where they are now and looking at the current situation. And, I just, and I'm just curious what kind of ideas you guys have been thinking about how we could create like some sort of alternative, like literally power structure to, I mean, City Council is a great example. You know, in the past 10 years, we've reversed, you know, the power dynamics that were fought for, you know, to come back to a predominantly white held, you know, city council. And we have a, you know, a black African American mayor that we see is constantly, you know, it amazes me, I live in Jackson Ward, and I got a, a piece of mail 
from Doug's water, you know, vote for me for mayor. And on one side, it's it's him and he's standing there and whatever, whatever. And on the other side is just this blown up white family. And you're thinking, okay, like who is he? Who is he trying to appeal to? Like who is his voting base? Like who who are the people that he actually supports? And you realize that it's it's rich white people. And I think that's a threat to our community in Richmond. I mean, I don't have any money. You know, I live, <laughs> I live in a house, you know, I'm a white, and, and I think that's a dynamic that we're starting to see, is young, younger people not having a lot of money. So like, I live in a house, I pay $100 a month rent, because I share it with, you know, my girlfriend. And it's uh, $200. <laughs> and, um, anyway, so that's just like the dynamic I see, and I feel like it's impossible for us to move beyond that even with recognizing that history, until we start creating some sort of alternative institutions to combat and eventually evaporate the white supremacist notions that we have in society. And I mean, it includes, you know, not having cable television. That includes, I think, getting rid of a lot of, a lot of things. <laughs> um, I'm an advocate of, <clears throat> of economic integration and political integration. I think that, um, that when we look back at what we're talking about in this situation, you know, you're talking about about um, race as a as an issue of of social treatment, social attitude, and social discrimination. But the, but what we've really got is two economic systems, um, which are really uh, one's designed to be dependent on the other, and um, you've got a situation where you. Uh, the only thing that really works in a healthy society, which is um, the ability for an entire economic system to reinforce itself and support the totality, is broken up. So you end up with um, deliberately economically segregated um, environments <coughs> that then uh, that then limit opportunity for everybody. I. Um, you know, the, the discussions tonight on people's choices about uh, who they live with and how they live, um, you know, are very, speak very strongly to me. I mean, I, people, I'm a parent of four kids, um, and, um, you know, we deliberately chose to live in the environment we lived in, and if we'd wanted to live in another one, I'd like to have been able to do that too. But, but the fact that you can't get a job if you live in the city of Richmond, um, because you can't, if you don't, can't afford a car, you can't get to it. That seems crazy to me. And, and so the, the choices that people need to make as they work their lives out together are restricted by a deliberately distorted uh, economic and political structure. That to me is crazy and uh, destructive, um, creates all sorts of other, of other spirit that's destructive, and that's what I'd like to, to work for. So help us get a public transportation system. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, I, think, I think we have to understand uh, how racism and white supremacy have evolved, and in that the old South and this idea of just overt and hateful speech and cross burning is kind of like a notion of the past. In fact, even this, this more subtle racism is becoming obsolete. And now we, we have to be aware that we're seeing a uh, status quo uh, come in the form of change. And, 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 and now I guess since uh, Obama won, I can talk about it now. <laughs> more, and not risk harm to my physical self. But but again, status quo come in the form of change. I, I think and the same thing about um, Jones and Wilder. Because we have been socialized and conditioned to see things in, in, in racial terms, um, we now think that our salvation, this is, this is the other part of this white supremacy coin in terms of segregation, that the, the black community has been socialized to wait on this savior. Um, and, and uh, it was Obama, and he didn't do it the first four years, so we now, uh, said he has four more years to save us. But the chances are that, that if you understand politics, that he gets a playbook. So hey, this, these are the plays you're running. There's no discussion, no debate about what he's going to do. 
the people who made him. You, you can, we saw this in the election on both sides. We saw the, the, the kingmakers, uh, in their, in, and they haven't changed. This idea that we're more diverse and, and, and uh, equal egalitarian society is nonsense. We saw the kingmakers rear their heads on occasion, right? Um, and, and those are the folks who are making the decisions. And, and once we understand that, we can make better decisions. So I won't be voting for people because I have this idea that they're on my side. When I have a hundred years of history that says, no, just because you look like me don't mean you, you roll them with me. <laughs> right? And, and, and if I haven't learned anything, I should have learned that. And this is the illusion of race. That one of the illusions that, that, you know, and certainly there are both illusions on both sides, but that's the black illusion that has gotten us in trouble. And so uh, Wilder is an example um, that, that perhaps his interests aren't the interests of the black community. And uh, he knows that and takes that for granted. And so I think that we have to begin thinking smarter about our leadership. Um, and so it's real complex. And we, we need to have uh, much more thoughtful reactions. And sometimes those reactions don't result in us feeling good. Now, we all like to feel good and think that we're all part of humanity and we love each other, and we should. But we haven't arrived yet because we have some work to do. And we haven't even begun to do the work in terms of uh, healing and reconciliation. Uh, yeah. um, we haven't, haven't even acknowledged anything happened. And it's hard to do that here in Richmond, but we manage. Um, and I, I think Anna and I have been involved with some kind of history projects that involve uh, the historical uh, transgressions against African descent folk here in Richmond. And at that time, you can discover that people aren't really willing to talk about that. And as a therapist, as a psychologist, I know that you really can't move on and begin to heal until you confront your trauma. And, and it's not just black folk that have been traumatized. White folk have been traumatized, too. And of course, I understand that there's just more than black and white folk. But as black and white folk, we have about 400 year history. We're like an incestuous family. We have a lot of baggage <laughs> and secrets. You know what I'm saying? We got secrets and baggage and, and all kind of stuff. You see what I'm saying? But you know, my skin is like it is because we got secrets. <laughs> Ain't nobody in my family married to nobody who's white, but we got secrets. You know what I'm saying? So until we get to deal with our baggage, we can't really talk about healing. And, and so I think. arrival on these shores was to be commodities in this economy. And we have returned to that, that, that the prison industrial complex is booming uh, through the wholesale exploitation of black bodies, right? Now, if you look at the other industries that are also booming because of poverty and black folk, um, police forces, surveillance, and all kinds of other kinds of industries that crop up around uh, disenfranchised and disposable people. So I think the fact that we haven't really talked about the idea that black people are still considered disposable, and that we used to have a real clear, practical purpose in terms of our labor, but that purpose has evaporated. So now our bodies, to some degree, in terms of incarceration and, and, and unthinkable numbers, has provided some economic uh, utility, but not enough. And so we become disposable, and, and you know, it's really complex. And when people arrive at this disposable point, it's very difficult to, to, to use traditional methods to get them out of that. All right, um, uh, Reverend Campbell, uh, I don't want to undermine
friend because I work for you, so. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good idea. Good. <laughs> I mean, um, like I, I'm thinking about public transportation. So, because I work with the kids from Armstrong um, High School. And so I'm thinking, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna open up our, our bus lines and be able to transport kids and, and folks of uh, working age out to Short Pump and out to Chesterfield to be able to work and to go, you know, kind of spend their money in this economy. But at the same time, they're gonna come back to the same, you know, I mean, this is a question I'm pretty sure you get asked a lot. They're gonna come back to, to, to Wickham Court, they're gonna come back to Mosby, they're gonna come back to Crane Court, where they're gonna see bottles on the ground, they're gonna see that there's, where there's a place where there's really no economy. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, is the answer, is the answer integration of, of, of public transportation has to take these people outside of, of where they live Okay, so they can spend their money there rather than build up the economy in those places. And, and like you said, Peter, you would have to have to do a lot of job and, and workforce development so that you know you can build that place up. Because with, without that place being developed and those people being developed, sending them out the short pump, I mean, I, I don't I don't necessarily see you know I, I don't see like the, the the not the grand purpose, but I don't necessarily see. Like the for that. Like there, are, there are three there are three things in the employment picture one is um, bringing better uh, employment into the city where folks live and one is um, making sure that where employment is in counties uh, people of modest income can live there and the third is transportation that means wherever a job is you can get to it but what you say are you and I live and work in the same place so we know how deserted economically um, this neighborhood that got deliberately created is and it's not healthy and you know obviously we do anything we can to do it uh, public transportation is not a panacea however um, it's one of the quickest ways to make sure some of our kids get jobs right now so that's we, uh, I'm speaking to this point, uh, yes, absolutely, there needs to be economic development driven into the city, but to go back to some of my observations a little earlier, uh, one of the great tragedies is the extent to which uh, our structures and institutions, which are creations of law, particularly at the state level, have put the redirection of economic development into the city um, in a very problematic case simply because as I noted we don't have that much developable land and and there's the, the fact that we live in such a small highly constricted geographic boundary which was done quite purposely um, and given the extent of uh, poverty in this city, really makes it a challenge to, to develop uh, any kind of large scale uh, business or industry that really would provide living wages for people who could stay in the city, move out of public housing. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. And again, it just, um, I, and, and we're gonna come face to face with some realities here soon when all the public housing in the city will be dismantled. And this is where I, I hold fast to, to my commitments of the importance, and I'm not talking about race here so much as income, that we've got to learn to live together across levels of income. And it will do us no good to reshuffle public housing if we're simply displacing poverty from one place to another. We have got to develop mixed income communities. And when we do, we're at the same time introducing um, the uh, kind of, uh, and we're really introducing the full arena of the, the humanity that lives in this Central Virginia area. 
Um, that's going to be the battle, though. Uh, trying to get mixed income housing into the counties. So transportation is important, but where people live is important. And having the opportunity to live in anywhere. I guess fundamentally, what I'm talking about, and this is frankly another way to define poverty, is that those who are poor have no choice. You know, we talk about public choice and that competition is good. People and businesses move where they do because they can get what they need at the cost that they can, uh, at, at the right cost. But that whole notion assumes mobility. And people who are poor don't have any mobility at all. They're stuck, They're absolutely uh, uh, in place for, in some cases, generations. So how do we break through that uh, we certainly cannot continue that phenomenon. It has, if, if we care anything, frankly, if we care anything at all about the health of this nation, as well as the health of Central Virginia, we have got to break up these concentrations of poor. And we have got to provide opportunity and mobility. And for those who would like to stay in the city, then they ought to have that choice. But to be completely cut off from any choice, regardless of what one race is. But the fact of the matter is that so many of the poor are black and Latino. And to have no choice about whether you live here or there, whether it's integrated or not, to have no ability at all to be is the biggest crime of all. And that fundamentally is what we've got to address. And I'm so glad that that you all have brought in these points about the transportation and the housing and all these competing needs because the way you overcome your fear of whatever you've got got you there in the first place that that development that flight to get you out of the city in the first place segregation is isolation but you have a lot of dynamics that create that need that common ground for the need for transportation the need for mixed income development, the need for you've got this aging population, so you have people who can't stay in the housing that they're in now. They need to have accessible housing. They need to have accessible transportation. They can't drive. They're no longer mobile, so they're going to have to do something. So you have this housing stock that's going to go unused, that's going to be affordable, you have people who need to get to the employment, but now you have counties who don't want, they're afraid, they don't want it out in Chesterfield or wherever. So how do you get over that hump? How do you get that transportation out there to get to the affordable housing? And how do you develop the mixed income housing that people need and get the transportation there? You know, I mean, and please, so the kind of the, the inconvenient truth that I'm thinking about all this is that if we reach some kind of equilibrium or reach some reach some type of situation where we think that we've achieved something I'm fearful that no one in this room will be alive to actually see it because we didn't get here overnight. If we look at the law, the codification as we talked about before, which this dates back mm -hmm. 200 years, etc., even further than that in this country. And so at the point where we're going to see something may not be within five years, 10 years, etc. That doesn't mean that we understand the concept of entropy comes to my mind, which is systems when when you you look at the codification of certain things if you proceed to strip away thoughtfully the things that have allowed us to arrive to this point and then you set the system in motion some kind of natural equilibrium is eventually reached whatever that looks like but the concept that we need to do what's smart now not for results that we might expect six months from now five years from now ten years from now 
it may be long after all of us are gone because we didn't get here. Quite important that you're driven by frustrating for me right now, and this is not the launch into a technology discussion, but is the superficiality at which um, our people in general, because I've got one, um, are receiving and processing information. It's far too quick, and we are jumping to conclusions at um, remarkable rates and then leaving those conclusions. Um, we do not think, we do not get bored to overcome that boredom by thinking through it um, and stimulating uh, those thoughts. But not to not to take that too far out, you really do have to stop and think of what you actually believe in. And if we're thinking about what, what kind of place we want Richmond to be, um, what kind of place you want to live in and, and uh, you expect to die in, children through or because they may not stay in <laughs> any event. The place that you create as your place of being um, has to be something that you invest in what you will see in the mind. You have to do it as part of your form. And you have to not be afraid of, of not being sure and being able to have those conversations and being willing to sort of wrangle through it. Um, that's terribly important. It's way more important to do that you know, at home and by yourself, um, or equally as important as doing it in an arena like this, you know, it's all safe and available. But it's very difficult because things don't happen. But at the same time, things happen in fits and starts. So the reason for being that critically thoughtful about things is that you are prepared when change does happen. Because it can jump on you. It can jump on you. It should not be reactionary. I, I want to thank everybody for your patience. Uh, it's really a great start, and I hope we'll be able to, to host more things.